This conference will now be recorded. Uh, and I also wanted to let everyone know um, our next educational event will be a live event at Rush University. Uh, it'll be November 3rd. It's a Saturday. So check the um, e-newsletter for more information coming soon. Uh, and without any further ado, I want to uh, introduce to you Dr. Robert Katz. Um, Dr. Robert Katz is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Rush University Medical Center, a graduate of Columbia University and the University of Maryland Medical School. Dr. Katz completed his internal medicine training at Washington University Medical Center and his fellowship training in rheumatology at the Johns Hopkins Medical School. Dr. Katz became a Master of the American College of Rheumatology, the college's highest award. Currently, Dr. Katz serves in differing capacities on various local boards, including Chairman of the Medical Advisory Board of the Ulupa Society of Illinois, and served on the Board of Directors of the Arthritis Foundation of Illinois. Nationally, Dr. Katz served on the Board of the Lupus Research Alliance and also on the Board of Directors of the Lupus Foundation of America. Dr. Katz has been the recipient of multiple awards and has also been included in Best Doctors in America, Best Doctors in Chicago, Guide How to Find the Best Doctors, and Top 1% of Rheumatologists Nationally by U.S. News and World Report. And without any further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Katz. Uh, thanks so much, Mary. Uh, could you repeat that introduction? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I could, actually. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, long-term effects of lupus, living with lupus, long-term effects. So let's begin our talk. Um, you know, lupus is a word that means wolf in Latin. And I was always curious as to how they came up with that name. And I really think it's because when you had a very red rash, which the Latin word is erythematous, so lupus erythematosus, um, and it was on the face to some people might have looked like a wolf even with discoid lupus or other scaly looking things on the face. And they therefore called a lupus erythematosus red rash that looks kind of like a wolf. And then uh, later they added the systemic because they figured out later that it causes all kinds of other symptoms like joint pain and you know, kidney problems and internal manifestations. So that's how the name came about. First it was the rash, and then it was the systemic features. And, you know, you guys there know about that, whether you feel a lot of fatigue, whether you feel a lot of joint aches and pains, whether you have had a history of a significant rash or pleurisy or, you know, other manifestations of lupus, it's systemic. So uh, in going through the slides, Systemic lupus erythematosus, you know, lupus erythematosus red, is an autoimmune disease and where the immune system harms the body's own healthy cells and tissues. So you guys know that the immune system protects us all, but autoimmune, and auto means self, it's immunity against the self, against the body's own tissues. And we see inflammation there We on when we look at uh, biopsy material where there are antibodies that normally protect us, but these are antibodies like anti-DNA antibodies and anti-nuclear antibodies that seem to have the immune system actually harm us. So it's autoimmune, it's misdirected, and we got to control that out of whack immune system. What are the features of systemic lupus? Well, there's a malar rash. A malar rash is a rash on the face. There's a discoid rash sometimes, which is like a very scaly rash that looks like a, a, a circle, a disc. There's photosensitivity, which is uh, reactions from the sun that may be anywhere from a systemic thing to rashes. There are oral ulcers. There's arthritis that you know about with lots of of joint pain, either, you know, uh, constantly or coming and going. Serositis means pleurisy, where there's fluid in the chest, and we take a deep breath, it hurts. And pericarditis is another form of serositis in which there's fluid around the heart in the area called the pericardium, which surrounds the heart, and there's also chest pain with that. Renal disorder or kidney disorder, which we'll go over later. Neurologic disorder, which we'll talk about. Seizures and other manifestations of lupus. 
Hemologic disorder means that the blood cells can be abnormal. You can have a low white blood cell count. You can have a low red blood cell count, which is anemia. And you can have a low platelet count, which if it gets low enough can cause bleeding. And then an immunologic disorder in which the antinuclear antibody test is almost always positive, but also other antibodies, which we'll get to later, including the famous anti-DNA antibodies, but anti-Smith and anti sjogrens A and other autoimmune antibodies as well. So you don't have to have all these manifestations manifestation to be classified as lupus, but enough of them where they add up to give you a diagnosis of a systemic autoimmune condition. Now, again, here are some of the pictures where you get the butterfly rash on the face. And you can see it goes over the nose and into the forehead and across the cheeks. You can get uh, manifestations of around the heart, and you can get um, blood manifestations and muscle and joint pain and hair loss and sometimes fever and sometimes an unusual headache. You can get kidney problems with blood in the urine or a lot of swelling in the legs and protein in the urine which we see on the urinalysis analysis, uh, urinalysis and pleurisy and even blood clots of the lung, pulmonary emboli. And, um, and so these are the, why it's systemic. And everybody's a little different. We'll get to the genetics a little, in a little bit later, but everybody's a little bit different. They manifest it differently. This is a bad lupus rash. You can see it's all over the face. It tends to, to spare, but not completely, the uh, nose, lips, that um, that little area that between the nose and the lips, the nasolabial fold tends to spare that. But you can see how it looks like it's a sun-sensitive reaction. It tends to occur in areas exposed to the sun, and, um, and that's the way it can look. A biopsy of this would confirm that it's lupus-related rash. Here's another lupus rash. It's more extensive. It's called subacute cutaneous lupus and it's cutaneous as skin, and it's a, an extensive lupus rash. We have much better treatment for dealing with these things now, more options, which we'll get to later, but this is a more extensive lupus rash. And if you biopsied it, you'd see those unfriendly antibodies in the biopsy specimen. This is the uh, Raynaud's phenomenon and vasculitis, where there's blood vessel inflammation that can cause damage even to the fingertips at times. The joints rarely look like this. This is a fancy name, Jacuz arthropathy, in which there's deviation of the fingers, um, but no damage actually on the x-ray. Uh, but uh, you can certainly get arthritis and various kinds of symptoms with um, uh, joint pain, as you know, with, uh, with lupus. Again, the facial rash, the butterfly rash over the nose, over the cheeks, uh, this is a much more extensive vasculitis inflammation rash that you can get with lupus, so the rash may vary a lot according to the antibodies that you have, according to the genetics. These are, as you see, these oral ulcers. Um, they can be painful or painless, but they may occur with um, active lupus. Hair loss can be fairly extensive with lupus. People ask me about hair loss. Unless you have the other manifestations of lupus, not just the antinuclear antibody, um, it may not be related. But if you have the other manifestations like rash and joint pain and things, then hair loss is common. Generally grows back, though, when you're in remission. And as you know, uh, lupus is not so much curable, but as it will go into remission, which is uh, a good, good aspect of it. So this is what the kidney looks like um, normally with uh, filters. That's a filter, filters urine, and it's just sitting there doing its filtering thing. And then the next slide, suddenly you get these white antibody things. You see these antibodies? Those are anti-DNA antibodies, and they're starting to collect in the kidney. But what the heck are they doing there? Get, get out of here. Get out of their antibodies. Oops. Now they're filling the whole kidney, and they're really going to cause autoimmune trouble in the kidney where a lot of the cells will start becoming hyperactive and uh, autoimmune. These arrows indicate the antibodies, the, the DNA antibodies connected to DNA, uh, and these deposits in the kidney, this is under an electron microgram, electron microscopy. See these deposits accumulating? What do they do? Well, there they are in uh, bright, bold colors. 
those we can see those antibodies, and that's why we know it's autoimmune. We can visualize the antibodies in the kidney. Does yours have audio? Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Mary. So this is a kidney which isn't totally normal, but you can see it has a certain architecture to it. And then this is a kidney that's not at all normal, where the kidney is being destroyed by these anti-DNA and other antibodies that are part of active lupus, and they're just completely damaging the architecture and the function of the kidney. So the kidney is a filter. It filters out uh, stuff that you don't need and keeps in stuff that you do need. So when you see kidney lupus, you'll usually see the urinalysis has lots of extra protein that's leaking, leaking out of the kidney filter because sort of like a coffee filter, if you tear it and it's not working, you'll get coffee grounds in the coffee. Well, here you get protein in the urine uh, because the filter isn't working with all these antibodies attacking it. And uh, sometimes it leads to a lot of swelling of the legs and poor kidney function that can lead to pretty serious course in some people. Now, the kidney lupus or nephritis comes in different forms. It can be mild, called mesangial. It can be more advanced with a lot of scarring and a lot of inflammation. So there are different forms, and a kidney biopsy establishes that, and on the need for treatment and the aggressiveness of treatment. This is a brain thing. I don't know if you see these dark lesions on the left, and the right there are white lesions. This is somebody who developed lupus of the brain. You can see it in the joint, in the, rather in the spinal fluid with high levels of protein and certain abnormal um, bands that you see um, with special testing. And you can see it on the MRIs with uh, different white spots or areas that correlate with neurological either damage or things, as I mentioned, seizures or areas of confusion. So between the MRI, between the spinal fluid analysis, and the symptoms and exam, uh, it can be established whether this is neurological lupus. Now, there are all these different antibodies. And just to show you one antibody panel, there's single-stranded DNA antibodies, which are nonspecific. This person's double-stranded DS DNA antibodies are actually in the normal range. But the SM or Smith antibodies are way up here. You see them way up here, close to 1,000. And the ribonucleoprotein SM or Smith antibodies are way up there. And the Sjogren's A, SSA antibodies are pretty high. Sjogren's B antibodies are a little bit high. Histone antibodies are high normal. Scleroderma antibodies, SEL70, are normal. So we use these panels to help interpret What's going on? Is it definitely lupus? Have you added on antibodies? Um, and what pattern of lupus is it likely to be? Uh, one famous study in lupus tracked people in the military. You started with an antinuclear antibody. And those people that added on these other special antibodies over a 10-year period tended to develop lupus. <laughs> the people that just stayed with the ANAs only often did not really develop the full-blown systemic disease. Um, so without seeing people, I hope people are following this okay. But the, um, and this is another antibody profile. The single-stranded DNA antibodies are sky high, but they're not as important. But the double-stranded DNA antibodies, DS, DNA, are very high. Um, they could be causing all kinds of trouble in this patient. Smith antibodies are in the normal range. Ribonucleoprotein, RMP, and Smith combination are high. Sjogren's A, SSA are high, 540. Sjogren's B are also elevated. Uh, histone antibodies are normal, and scleroderma antibodies are high at 320. So we take this together with the patient's symptoms and physical findings, and we go from there in terms of defining how active the disease is and what the problems are, because this is an autoimmune disease. You need autoimmune antibodies. The long-term effects depend on whether you can control these antibodies and the immune response, which can be very active, but misdirected. Another thing you have to worry about a little bit in lupus is not directly related to lupus, but you don't want to get a lot of cholesterol plaque. See the wall of the artery and the cholesterol fatty deposits developing. There's a buildup of the plaque, and then there's a uh, 
partially blocked artery. So you know, besides, you know, the long-term effects are not just uh, lupus autoimmune alone. They're controlling blood pressure. They're making sure the blood sugar is okay, especially on prednisone. And they're also looking to be sure that cholesterol and triglycerides are, are controlled and avoiding plaque buildup um, and atherosclerosis. Now, there are other autoimmune diseases that are defined by heredity, lifestyle, besides lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, pulmonary scarring or pulmonary fibrosis. Um, there's, you know, scleroderma. There's multiple sclerosis. There are a lot of autoimmune diseases, uh, but our disease that we need to know as much as possible about and understand is, is the lupus. Now, you have to get on treatment um, for if the lupus is, is too active. And treatment may start with anti-inflammatory medicines. It may start with Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, uh, which is mild, or it may be steroids. And steroids are really good because they work very swiftly. It depends on the dose, but they have their side effects. If you use too much of them, it makes you a little crazy or hyper, and it gives you a, a facial swelling cushionoid effect, named after Dr. Harvey Cushing. And then you can get a protuberant abdomen, and you can get uh, swelling, again, of the face. You can get acne. You can get uh, hair growth. You can get um, uh, 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 bruising and purplish appearance and thinning of the skin, so that there are, you know, there are long term effects related to dosage in prednisone. Not everybody gets this, but the higher doses will lead to this cushionoid appearance. So what about other treatments that are available to ameliorate the long-term effects? Well, this is comparing mycophenolate, which is also called Cellcept, and is an immune suppressant drug. Why do we give immune suppressants? Because the immune system is going wacko, crazy. It's over overactive, but misdirected. We gotta calm you down for a while. Then maybe we'll get off of your immune suppressant medicine. And this is compared to oral or PO cytoxin in lupus. And basically, there were good effects of both drugs. So if you've got active lupus, like the kidney or neurological or whatever, you can go on an immunosuppressive drug like this cell cell mycophenolate, sometimes uh, cytoxin that's pretty toxic, and sometimes imuran and methotrexate and others to calm that wild immune system down without resorting entirely uh, to uh, high doses of steroids. So this is what uh, a, um, uh, a um, B cell, a lymphocyte called a B cell, it looks like. So this B cell makes antibodies. And um, uh, there is a membrane attack on this B cell sometimes that destroys uh, this thing with certain drugs, which we'll talk about. But you can see these antibodies uh, next to the, um, on the cell surface, these yellow things attaching to the B cell, and the B cell is making these antibodies. And so it's kind of complicated, but we're now looking at the immune system and B cells and T cells, uh, thymus cells. And this is bulimumab, which is Benlista. Anybody in the audience here on Benlista? That's the first biologic medicine approved, the first medicine approved in like 50 years for systemic lupus, and it's given intravenously, but it was effective compared to um, inert placebo medicine in helping to control lupus without resorting entirely to steroids. It's a monthly IV infusion. It's usually very well tolerated, and uh, it's now out there as they're developing other clinical trials for lupus biologic drugs. This is Hiram Dudson, member placebo group. Get that? <laughs> so active treatment is important. Now these are some antibodies, and the reason I'm showing you is that these are what we call monoclonal antibodies. This is a murine or a mouse monoclonal antibody. This is a mixture of mouse human. This is a humanized monoclonal antibody. This is medicine in 2018. Monoclonal antibodies. The initials for monoclonal antibody or antibodies, you know, against certain targets, like in lupus, it's these um, uh, these B cells, B20 cells making all these antibodies. Um, 
But these monoclonal antibodies, the initials are MAB, monoclonal antibody. So when I first went into rheumatology, I used to see these lupus patients getting sick. We would put them on steroids. We put them on immunosuppressives. But um, we needed other tools, and biologics came along, the first one in uh, 1998 for rheumatoid arthritis. And you see on TV all the time, these are all biologics. They can predispose to infection, but they're extremely effective, these monoclonal man antibodies, MABs. That's the, what they look like under the way under the microscope. So see all these biologic agents. A lot of them have MAB, MAB, MAB. They're monoclonal antibodies, and they have targets, IFN, interferon alpha, or IFN, interferon alpha, or interleukin-6, IL-6. So the research today, a lot of times, is trying to develop MABs, monoclonal antibodies, against certain targets that we think have to do with active lupus. These are on the surface of these B cells or B lymphocytes um, that make all these antibodies, and we want to quiet these antibodies down. So we are trying and experimenting with new monoclonal antibodies, MABs. That's the future of lupus. Now, there are other things associated with lupus that you should be aware of. There's antiphospholipid antibodies. They're anticardiolipin antibody, beta-2 glycoprotein, lupus anticoagulant. And those antibodies, if positive and high enough, can lead to strokes and arterial thrombosis. Uh, it can lead to venous thrombosis or blood clots in the legs. They can lead, or the, or the lungs. They can lead to other abnormalities, pregnancy, loss. Um, so the, these antiphospholipid antibodies should also be measured in lupus patients to see what the risk is for blood clots. So what are the treatment recommendations overall for long-term effects? See where it says American College of Rheumatology Committee, mild SLE, mild lupus. You start with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like, you know, naproxen, Celebrex, ibuprofen. You go to hydroxychloroquine or antimalarials, and you can use low-dose glucocorticoids, which are steroids, like prednisone. But in serious life-threatening or organ-threatening lupus, Okay, let's give you high doses of glucocorticoids to try to get you into remission, not forever, and immunosuppressive drugs or cytotoxic agents like azathioprine or imuran, cyclophosphamide, cytoxin, and methotrexate. And they don't have on here the biologic Benlista, but that's now for moderate um, lupus activity. And then there, here's the European League Against Rheumatism, which is pretty much recommending the same therapies um, which So it depends on whether or not this is aggressive and serious and organ-threatening or even life-threatening or it's rather mild, and the therapy has to be based on that. So um, these are some of the uh, potential side effects of these drugs. Methotrexate, you can have uh, bone marrow suppression, a a liver toxicity. You can have lung things, uh, the cell sept. You can have anemia, low white blood cell count, low platelets, and this uh, benlista belimumab, the monoclonal antibody, MAB, infections, and um, some other things. But generally, these are generally well tolerated, but you got to see your doctor, presumably your rheumatologist or, you know, nephrologist if it's, you know, kidney or something, to be sure that you're monitored properly on these, especially on these stronger drugs. So what are the genetics and the molecular pathogenesis of lupus? People are looking at that in different ancestries, looking for the genes that predispose. And you can see that there are many genes that have been discovered that are associated with lupus susceptibility. It's not just two or three genes if you wanted to be tested. And they probably determine which antibodies you're going to develop, the autoimmune antibodies in the immune system, and what direction this is going to go. And people will look for immune profiles, uh, genetic profiles in the future to judge therapy and make it patient-specific, but they're not there now. And there are really over 80 genes that have been discovered. These are a lot of them that are associated with lupus susceptibility and also Sjogren's syndrome susceptibility. It's not worked out where we just get a quick genetic test to see if your family is predisposed. But there are lots of anti antibodies around, but is it going to you know, affect your family? Well, hopefully it won't, but we're still working on the genetics of this condition, uh, lupus.
Uh, again, more than 80 susceptibility loci reported to show robust genetic association with systemic lupus. So in summary, lupus has a genetic component, but not well defined in terms of just get these two or three genes. It's many genes and those combinations which predispose. Some people have a lot of autoimmune antibodies. Some people's autoimmune antibodies go crazy and haywire and attack the kidney or attack the skin or attack the joints and cause a lot of joint pain, a lot of fatigue, a lot, a lot of rashes, um, chest pain with pleurisy or pericarditis, hair loss, brain problems at times, and lots of things. So possibly because of the genetic variability and the antibody profile variability, the disease had different clinical manifestations. So lupus is not just lupus. You have to define that it's lupus and what exactly is going on, how active is it, and then uh, tailor therapy to lupus to combat the long-term effects. And if you're in remission, not cured, but remission, you can get down and off of a lot of these uh, drugs, and we have to watch out for toxicity. But um, uh, some of these um, are very robust, and we have to watch them carefully. Others are, you know, pretty easy to follow. So what is lupus? It's not lupus, except when it's lupus, says you know, Dr. House. So uh, that's the story of lupus in a nutshell from me. And uh, I think that might be the end. Yeah, so that's the end. So I am hope to summarize some of the long-term effects, different organ systems of lupus, but you each have your individual clinical stories, and I'm glad to try to answer your questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Katz. Um, I'm going to actually unmute Amy Bingenheimer. She she told me she has a question. Hi, Amy. Hello. Um, my question is, do you see a lot of scalp swelling with lupus? With or without hair loss, when you say scalp swelling? Um, without hair loss. And is there no rash there? No. I think it's always a question if there's no rash, no hair loss, if any, if, you know, the only way to know sometimes is to take a biopsy of the scalp to see if it shows these crazy antibodies that you may have seen in the previous specimens. So it's nonspecific in terms of scalp, so it could be, but it's sort of difficult to tell. Um, but a, a rheumatologist might look at it and say, well, I think there is a rash there or something, or, or, or request a biopsy, but it's not a common symptom. Okay, thank you. Sure, Amy. Okay, and somebody else just, um, oh boy, I was getting a lot of um, questions here. I'm going to unmute everyone, um, and then someone will ask a question, then we'll mute everybody's lines again, okay? Uh, so does anyone else have a question for Dr. Katz? <laughs> Anyway, I do. Okay. A um, couple of things. One is about. Um, uh, you know what? Hold on just one second. I'm going to mute everyone and then. Okay. I unmuted uh, you for your question. And if you could go ahead, please. Sure. Um, so my question is about. Um, oh, you know what? Can you put sorry, the volume you down on your. That's what's happening. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, my question is about um, the sun. What what happened? You know, with the sun. That's my first question. Um, what happens with the sun and why uh, in our bodies? And disproportionate number of nausea. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask actually because we can't really understand with all the feedback on your um, on your phone. Mm -hmm. Would there be any way? Could you um, text me like through the chat? Could you chat me your um, your question? Oh wow! Um, Would that be possibly. okay? You know what? The feedback seems to be over now. So if you want to go ahead and ask your question, yes. Okay. Does that okay. sound better? Yes, it does actually. Okay, it's the phone. I didn't do anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, so 
two questions. One was about um, uh, nausea. Uh, you know, what causes the nausea and what can you do to minimize or stop it? Uh, and then to the sun, um, what what does the sun do exactly specifically that causes problems? Right. Well, um, take on nausea first. I mean, nausea has to be evaluated to see if it's, you know, part of the active systemic lupus and requires lupus treatment, whether it's, uh, you know, steroids or uh, prednisone or, or, or Plaquin or something, or if it's kind of a separate issue or it's, or it's secondary to the medications that are being given either for lupus or for something else. So nausea can be due to a lot of things, so like dizziness or something. It can be nonspecific, but it could be related to something that we, you find in the workup. So whether you see a gastroenterologist, whether you eliminate certain medicines, whether you add a nausea pill for nausea, it can be due to different uh, different things, and it has to be researched in terms of uh, why. In terms of uh, sun sensitivity, it's so characteristic of lupus, but only about 40% of lupus patients are sun sensitive. And occasionally, patients will get systemically ill where it activates these antibodies and activates the lupus or causes a certain amount of skin sun damage which then allows the lupus antibodies to jump in there and cause a, a, either a you know, significant rash in that area or a, even a systemic reaction. So you don't want to wake up those antibodies by having too much sun exposure. But if you're not that sun sensitive and, and you don't really get sick from it, I, I wouldn't protect myself too much because you know, it's like you can become a hermit because you're so afraid of the sun and it might not even be a factor. There's only about 40% of lupus patients are sun sensitive, and some of those only mildly sun sensitive. Thank you. I wondered about that. <laughs> I don't want to hate the sun. No, if it doesn't cause a problem, even if you have lupus, I wouldn't worry about it. I, I definitely would use sunblocks. I mean, there are lots of bad things about the sun, including uh, skin cancer, but uh, use, use good, strong sunblocks and reapply them when, they, when you perspire a lot and they, they go away. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, I also know that uh, I believe it's her name is Marty Nearing. She has a question, so I'm going to unmute Marty. Um, do you want to ask your question? It doesn't look like you looks like you are muted. So uh, Marty's question was: When a patient is on medication, how do they know if they are in remission or if the symptoms are just being masked by treatment? Well, that's a common question. I mean, for the doctor and the patient, if you're doing better, let's say you had a fever and now you're doing better. Well, if we stop the medicine too quickly, is that fever going to come back? So you have to look at the whole profile. I'd like to know what were the symptoms in the lab test that were abnormal when you flared and became active? We sometimes go by something called the SED rate, which is a measure of inflammation, SED or the C-reactive protein, another inflammation measure, or the complement protein test where they get low in active lupus, or did you have a rash, or did you have joint pain, or you know, get a fever? So if I know what manifestations of your lupus uh, were occurring, both antibody levels, DNA antibodies, complements, things like that, when you were sick, I monitor those, principally those, not every antibody that exists but principally those that were abnormal when you were sick, principally the symptoms. Is a joint pain or rash coming back? And then try to taper the medicine over a period of time to see if these things start to come back. So if we were looking at DNA antibodies or the SED rate, let's say they were both high. Now we got them down quite a bit. <laughs> taper prednisone or taper the immunosuppressive, what's happening? So tapering the medicine and looking for return of the um, clinical manifestations and the antibodies and inflammation levels and things that are specific to that patient help you decide whether the patient is just controlled tapering but looking at specific markers based on that particular patient not every patient with lupus it says edit your name and email is that did that answer your question Kathy yeah. Okay. You know, Dr. Katz, I actually have a question. 
how do you determine, because obviously a lot of these drugs come with horrible side effects. So how do you determine with a patient when the treatment is uh, worse than the symptoms? Do you know, like, do you have sort of a, you know, just a, a school of thought for how you determine that? Well, you know, I showed that one slide for mild lupus and uh -huh. for more severe or life-threatening lupus mm -hmm. <clears throat> or very active kidney lupus or brain lupus. If you try to judge the severity of symptoms and match the intensity of treatment with the severity of symptoms and whether it's bothering major organs or not, or even like threatening or not. And so these drugs have significant side effects at higher doses or with more toxic medicines, cytoxin, more toxic. Um, you know, most of the time I see these drugs and you look on TV if they ever advertise them, it would scare you half to death. But I don't really see a lot of side effects for a lot of these drugs if used judiciously and monitored. So, I mean, you know, you just have to match the patient's intensity of symptoms and monitoring them with the drug. And you just have to be aware of side effects. But you don't see as many severe side effects, at least I don't, as, mm -hmm. as, as they list. Because the FDA makes you list, you know, death and every other side effect from right. lots of different medicines when it, they really don't tend to cause that in real life. Oh, okay. So, and how do you find, because um, Benlista was approved, and you talked about that a bit ago. Um, how effective has, I've heard mixed things here in my role at the LSI. Um, how have you found it with your patients? You know, I, I think that's a good point, that, that I find it moderately effective. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not a wonder drug, but it's moderately effective. And I like it particularly in people with rashes or people that are reasonably sick and they just don't want to be on a lot of steroids. Because the other drugs aren't perfect either. To put somebody on Celsept or methotrexate or, you know, those aren't so perfect. So you got to have a severe enough to disease to qualify for it, but it may be steroid sparing or prednisone sparing. And it's worth a trial in some patients, but it's moderately effective, not sensational. Right, yeah, like it doesn't work with everyone. But you know, the um the prednisone, the like long term effects of prednisone can be really difficult um for people to manage later on in life. Um, but there really is no substitute. If Ben Lista doesn't work, there's really no substitute for You try to keep theory. the prednisone dose as low as you can and get people off. Get people right. off. Right. You're right. Bone thinning, cataracts, weight gain. Mm -hmm. emotional things. I mean, it depends mm -hmm. on the dose, but they're not pretty, but it works right. instantly. So people right. who come to you feeling terrible, they'll take it and uh, try to limit the duration and the dose. Well, we get calls sometimes. People just take themselves off it. They dislike the, the um, side effects so much, and that's really dangerous, right? Well, you know, first of all, you know, basically you're covering up your adrenal gland. The adrenal gland makes the equivalent of prednisone or cortisone, cortisol. And so you don't want to like, you know, cover up that adrenal gland and then suddenly stop the drug after months because the adrenal gland goes into shut, not ready to take over. So you can get sick, pretty sick that way. You gotta taper the prednisone, even if you're frustrated with it, if you've been on it over a month. Okay. Okay. Um, I also got a question through chat from Roberta Morris. Um, she wants to know if pigmentation is an issue with lupus. Um, when you say, uh, uh, okay, so pigmentation can occur with lupus, yes. It can occur with Plaquenil sometimes. Um, it, it is an issue in some people, yes. It's um, not most, also some rashes, um, due to lupus, become hyperpigmented or dark. And so, yes, it's either um, sometimes with medicine, sometimes with lupus, sometimes with people's complexion and how they deal with uh, the rashes of lupus. Yes, it's it's a part of it. Okay. Um, is there any way to find out if it's the lupus or if it's a side effect to one of the drugs? Or does it not even matter? Yeah, no, I mean, sometimes you can biopsy it to take to okay. see how active the antibodies are and how much it looks like it's skin lupus. It's Sometimes it's a, it's a conference, so to speak, between the dermatologist and the rheumatologist. Do you think this is drug-related or is this part of their lupus? 
I mean, sometimes you need more people rather than less involved in the care when it involves different systems like the skin. Okay. Um, I got another question through chat. If you think you're in remission, how long should I continue taking the meds? Well, you should taper them. So it's not exactly how long because everybody's different. Let's say we have 10 lupus sitting in the room with me, and we said, okay, we're all going to taper now because we all appear to be in remission in terms of your blood tests, your clinical manifestations, let's say joint pain, rash, fatigue, you're so much better. We're all going to taper. Well, everybody's different. Some people are going to successfully taper and get off their treatment entirely, gradually. Other people are going to find problems when they go down their prednisone dose or stop their cell set or, you know, stop uh, Benlista or stop their Plaquenil. So it's worth trying in a lot of patients, uh, but everybody's a little different. Okay. So basically talk with your doctor about your specific situation. If you feel like you're going into remission. All those want. antibodies, all those manifestations, everybody's a little different. And is it mild? Is it severe? Is it organ threatening? Is it life and life threatening? Or is it like no big deal? Um, so yes, tapering depends on the severity, whether the symptoms are mild or, and, or, or, or likely to come back what the blood tests show, it's complicated, but you need a relationship with your doctor who gets to know you and know your lupus. Okay. Um, all right, here's another question through chat. It's from Bill. In recent years, lupus has been destroying my platelet to extremely low levels. I get treated with prednisone and IVIG every 12 months or so, and they go up for a year or so. Should treatments be more long-term? Um, for many years, he did not experience such low platelet numbers. Um, well, you know, that's a, you know, you know, there are medicines to turn off the antiplatelet antibodies, but there it gets complicated. And so, frankly, a year response is, isn't, isn't a bad response. It depends how low the platelets get. I mean, sometimes, you know, if they're enough, uh, certainly a thousand you don't worry too much about them um so you know it's that's where the uh rheumatologist and hematologist confer to see what are the other options besides you know besides prednisone and ivig um but a year is not a bad duration for a response i'm sorry what was that last part okay um I have another question through chat. Uh, can you speak to the benefits and side effects of Plaquenil? Yeah, Plaquenil is a mild drug. As you may know, because you're in the lupus community, it was used for malaria, just like chloroquine was, and hydroxychloroquine is. And it's been used for so many years, I can't believe it's still around, it's such an old drug. But it has moderate effectiveness. And when they've done studies to see what happens when people stop Plaquenil, they found that a lot of people flare stopping Plaquenil, and lupus becomes active again. So most rheumatologists like Plaquenil. It has a long duration of action. Um, it's even used during pregnancy, as is as sometimes Imuran, Azathioprine, and prednisone if necessary. Um, I personally don't favor it that much, but I have a lot of people on it because I think it's there's so many newer drugs, and it's mild. I hardly ever, but I have seen eye toxicity from Plaquenil. It's usually people have taken it for 10 or 20 years, and you have to be monitored for it. So it's it's moderately effective, and there are not many side effects. Pigmentation of the skin can occur. Uh, weakness can rarely occur, and eye changes are the major threat. But once a year, eye exams are sufficient. Okay. Um, all right, here's another question. How does lupus affect the spleen? Well, okay, so the immune system um, is, um, you know, throughout the body, and uh, people with active autoimmune disease um, may get enlarged spleen, sometimes with enlarged livers, too, and uh, uh, sometimes those spleens can cause platelet problems, those things that have to do with clotting in your blood, uh, because they get so big, and... Um, so treatment can shrink the spleen to some extent. Uh, we don't do many splenectomies. Take out the spleen because of low platelets like we used to. But the spleen can be affected 
by systemic autoimmune disease and get big. Okay. Um, here's another one. Have you seen rashes clear on patients? And if so, do you know why? I'm assuming they mean, you know, rashes clear up. Yeah, well, I've seen a lot of rashes spontaneously clear up. Um, you know, maybe sometimes they're sun-induced and now you're away from the sun for long periods. Obviously, lots of people, if it's bad enough, go on Plaquenil, they go on cortisone skin creams, they may take prednisone or other treatments. Um, actually, I, I have one paper on using this new psoriasis drug called Otesla in resistant lupus rashes. But sometimes the rash goes away. That's the whole thing with lupus. The symptoms may be intense in September, and the disease may go into remission by December, and all those things that were there are quiescent. It's quiescent right now. It varies quite a bit. And, and the rash can go away on its own okay. sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, though. Right. Well, that's lupus. It's so unpredictable, right? Yeah, you've got to keep monitoring because lupus, uh, exacerbations and remissions, you don't cure it, you control it, and sometimes it just goes to sleep for long periods. Right. I've had people that were super sick, um, people that we all know if we're part of the lupus society, super sick, that have no manifestations of lupus at all uh, currently. People with bad kidney disease, for example, or something, where now it's you know it's in remission. So it right. can be cure wouldn't be the good word, but remission is possible and 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 common. Right. So it's you would say it's common. Is it common for it to last for five years or ten years? Once I talked to a woman who was in remission for like forty years. I'm not even kidding. Is there like a a length of time that's sort of on average? No, there's no average because, again, there's so much variability with lupus. But, yes, mm -hmm. I've seen people who were sick as a dog in the hospital, and uh, and now they have no manifestation of lupus. They may, can, they may have the lupus antibodies, low complement protests or other things, but they don't have any signs of lupus, and they were sick. So, wow. yes, you, you, know, you can see people in remission for decades, sometimes yeah. who are really quite sick yeah so when they're in remission do they have to go see you like once a year or what's the protocol well first of all if you're on medicine you got to be monitored because you're talking about the right. evil horrible side effects of medicine mostly they don't occur but you have to be monitored if you're not on any medicines and you're doing great yeah i would say once a year is good you know um just mm -hmm. to check in and see how you're doing but a lot of patients will take something if they were sick enough and need more monitoring that, whether it's every three months or six months or whatever, depends on the intensity of disease. But I've had some patients, and this is a warning, I've had some patients that became non-compliant and ended up with dead kidneys because oh, they boy. had no idea what the heck was going on. And maybe mm -hmm. for academic reasons or they were too busy, they didn't check in. And then suddenly they come in and they're in real trouble and they have to be treated very aggressively and they've lost permanently a lot of kidney function. So you got to be keep an eye on this disease. Right. Okay, here's another question through chat. Um uh, Maria Gonzalez, I've never heard of getting off of Plaquenil. How do you know when you can get off? I've been on it for almost 6 years. Um well, I would say many rheumatologists keep people on it lifetime indefinitely. I don't tend to do that, but I don't push people off of it. It depends how sick they are. Um, it's a mild medication. But if I were in a discussion, there was another rheumatologist in the room, they'd say, oh, I usually leave people on it. So there, there is a little bit of, um, uh, of a difference of opinion on if you need to take it lifelong. Uh, but it is a, a mild medicine that he helps to keep the, the lupus in remission or helps to keep the intensity of symptoms down. So I'm not negating its effects, or t and there's, but I would say that that I I don't know that everybody needs to take it indefinitely. Mm. So it's the kind of thing you should talk with really your treating physician. Probably your treating doctor, and if yeah. somebody said said, well, I think you can get off, and somebody else says stay on it, you could get that with this because there's a controversy about. It. So, but mo more rheumatologists than not would say stay on it helps to keep the lupus under control with rather few. Side effects. Okay. 
Here's a question. Uh, someone emailed me. I'm on Benlista and I'm having issues with my bones and have not been able to focus while working. Could Benlista be affecting my brain? It's usually not Benlista affecting the brain. It's usually other manifestations uh, doing that, mental fogginess and stuff. You got to look at the lupus. But anybody who says, ever since I started XYZ medicine, I've been having, you know, brain fog, nausea, anything, yes, I think it's worth stopping the medicine and seeing if the symptoms go away and sometimes restarting them to see if the symptoms come back. Not always. <clears throat> but usually it's not that Ben Lista, but it's hard to be sure. So stopping it is certainly a reasonable thing to try. Okay. Um, here's another question. This one we get a lot. If you switch to a vegan diet, no meat, is it possible to come off of your medication? And can lupus be controlled with diet and exercise? Right. Well, that's a tough question in 2018 because it's so popular. You're talking about mm -hmm. cultural idea of treatment these days is, is which diet you're going to take. So as a rheumatologist, my focus is a little bit more on helping, not helping you choose a diet. That's a natural approach. You go to a lot of people for that. And if it works as an anti-inflammatory, gluten-free or whatever, stay on it. Stay on it. It's great. But I don't prescribe a specific diet because I'm looking for the science. And there's not a huge amount of science on which diet to use or exactly how effective the diet is going to be. I always think exercise is good for everybody. Improves energy, improves mood. And so I tell people sometimes in Chicago, get a stationary bike. You don't have to join uh, exercise, you know, uh, a, a gym uh, and pedal, put it in front of the TV, pedal for 15 minutes a day and get yourself in a good aerobic shape, even during inclement weather, freezing weather, and stay in shape. That's got to help your body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's another question through chat. Can lupus or the medication affect your teeth? Um, well, <clears throat> The thing that most affects the teeth in the autoimmune area is Sjogren's syndrome. So Sjogren's was named after an ophthalmologist in Sweden named Dr. Sjogren, S-J-O-G-R-E-N. -S he described dry mouth and dry eyes. And there are antibodies, there are Sjogren's antibodies that help confirm the diagnosis. And people with very dry mouth are definitely subject to all kinds of tooth decay and dental problems. So it's more the Sjogren's syndrome if, they, if patients have that, of which there's treatment for the dry mouth, Evozac is one treatment, which is a, a medication pill. Um, uh, did you, often the dryness more than anything else that can lead to, um, to, to dental problems. Okay. Um, there's a question from Barbara Holtz. I'm going to um, unmute you, Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Hello, Barbara. Dr. Katz. Hi, Barbara. Can How you are you? Hear me? I'm yeah, good. Yeah. How are you? Good. Um, is there a cumulative effect of taking Cellcept for, I, I, I failed to guess how long I've been on it, probably 10 years. If, if, there, yeah. if, there, were to be, if there were going to be side effects and you haven't had any by now, can you, are you safe to assume you won't get them? Pretty safe. I mean, it's a pretty safe drug. I haven't seen very many problems with it. You have to watch blood counts and stuff. But uh -huh. uh, infection can occur in, with any immunosuppressive drug. In some ways, you don't want to be on an immunosuppressive drug. Are you more susceptible to infection? And I tell some of my patients this new uh, shingles vaccine, which is not live, can be used even if you're on immunosuppression or prednisone. So, you know, immunosuppression is generally good. Sometimes it's, you know, you can get into problems with it. But there's no cumulative effect. It's not like at the end of some period, you've used up your time on it, you got to get off of it. And the immunosuppressive effect, if you haven't had any problems, usually you're not going to, but you got to be monitored and uh, be sure. You know, flu shot's good, pneumonia right. shot's good, and uh, and now the shingles. And what about the um, sun with that? What's that? Uh, is there uh, something to do with the sun and salsap, staying out of the sun while you're taking salsap? Not so much, no. You just have to be judicious with sun exposure, but not, like, totally obsessed with it unless you're right. extreme. Right. Not with salsap. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Okay. 
Um, so we do have a couple other questions. Um, have you seen any patients getting toxoplasmosis with lupus? One, years and years ago, if you're immune suppressed, you could, especially on the strongest immunosuppressive, the most toxic but the most aggressive, which is cytoxin. Um, I didn't mention rituxin, which is one can do it too. I, I saw one case of toxoplasmosis. I've seen a few cases of fungal infections like histoplasmosis, but not very many at all. So one case. And if you're immunosuppressed, you could get some strange infection like that one doesn't happen very often. Okay. Um, I know that it's uh, about one minute to seven. Do you have a couple minutes, Dr. Kitts? We still have a few more questions. Absolutely. If you don't, I... Okay. All right. Great. Hi. Lupus uh, friends. Okay. Uh, here's another chat question. Have you seen any patients with lupus who also have inflammatory conditions like hereditary angioedema? Yes. In other words, I see a lot of people with lupus who have, I would say the most common is probably thyroid disease, Hashimoto's thyroiditis or autoimmune thyroid disease. I mentioned Sjogren's disease where syndrome, where dry eyes and dry mouth. Um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, um, angioedema and stuff, not so much, but yeah, all these autoimmune diseases can sometimes overlap. So I have seen it not very often though, that, not that one very often. Okay. Um, here's another one. Can changes in weather cause a lupus flare? Well, I would say in general, stress is bad for you. Changes in weather can be bad for you sometimes. And they can aggravate your body. I wouldn't say they typically will cause a lupus flare, but they can make people feel worse. Um, and, you know, that's why you try to stay in shape, relax your body. Sometimes I tell people to meditate or anything, keep your body relaxed. Um, but changes in the weather may increase symptoms. They don't tend to cause DNA antibodies to increase or something, no. Okay. All right. So there's no specific correlation. It's really more of um, how it impacts it, you individually. And it's still for you, and, you know, you should just, you know, try to take it easy, so to speak. Okay. Um, is it safe to conceive while on Imuran? This is Jessica's question. Yeah, well, it is safe to conceive if you're on Imuran. Most people would then stop the drug, even though uh, in terms of uh, long-term studies, there doesn't appear to be any harm with Imuran throughout pregnancy. Obviously, you don't want to take it during pregnancy. You don't have to, but some people seem to have to. And there doesn't appear to be any significant toxicity with taking Imuran through pregnancy. But most, you know, a lot of young women with lupus are on methotrexate, Imuran, Cellcept or something because, and so if they tend, if they get pregnant or Ben Lista, um, they generally try to stop the medicine and just stay on steroids or prednisone. But Imuran is not thought to be toxic during pregnancy. It's just a okay. psychological thing too. If it, everything miscarriages, it doesn't turn out okay. You don't want to, in your own mind, have to blame the drug. Right. Okay. Um, all right, here's a question. <clears throat> if somebody has um, macular degeneration already and maybe Plaquenil isn't the best thing for them to continue to stay on, um, is there another medication that is like Plaquenil but won't impact the eyes in the same way? Yeah, so quinacrine, quinacrine, it's hard to get these days. I think it may not even be available anymore. Um, but quinacrine is a relative of hydroxychloroquine. Um, it's very pricey because you can get, maybe get in a compound pharmacy, but it's, um, it is a relative of Plaquenil and not eye toxic, but it's expensive, I think, these days and hard to get. Okay. I almost uh, give it. I'm sorry? I almost never give it anymore. I used oh. to because it's very hard to get. And okay. So. All right, we're going to do one more chat question, and then I'll open up the lines to see if anyone who just called in has any questions. Okay. Um, so, Mari, uh, Marie Gonzalez, what symptoms do we get when a doctor knows lupus is attacking our brain? Well, uh, you know, you get uh, occasionally confusion, usually with high fevers and stuff. And, again, the spinal fluid is generally abnormal. And the MRI of the brain is generally abnormal. 
and there may be manifestations on a neurological exam, uh, reflexes and other things. You can get seizures. That's not uncommon in lupus. Um, so confusion, seizures. Uh, you can get a, even a stroke sometimes, rarely, hopefully, you know, fortunately, mm -hmm. due to lupus. But there are a lot of um, described neurological complications that can occur with lupus, many of them uh, treatable and a few not so treatable. So if you gotta, you got to attack this early with high doses of steroids, sometimes intravenous steroids, and then cytoxin, the strongest immune immune suppressant drug, but you gotta be sure you know what you're dealing with. Even a brain biopsy can be done rarely in serious mm -hmm. cases. Is there any is there any drug like if there there are drugs specific for, for kidneys, is there anything specific for um when it's attacking your brain? Nothing specific, but uh okay. people will use toxin. They'll use they'll use the drugs that are available. Some of these M A B monoclonal antibodies that might be coming on board might be helpful for brain lupus, um, but um, um, high doses of steroids are the first thing tried, but there's nothing, no specific drug for brain lupus. Okay. All right. I am going to, anyone who chatted a question I haven't had an answer for, I will follow up with you um, individually. And I'm going to unmute the lines if anyone has a question. Um, you may have to unmute your own phone as well. Because uh, it doesn't look like everybody's phone came on. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Katz? Can you hear me? Uh -huh. if you, Mary, by the way, if you, if you write me with some questions, I'll try my best to answer them on the website or wherever. Okay, great. I will absolutely do that. Does anyone have a quick question, or are we, are we going to close it out? I have a out? question. Okay. If you've been on Plaquenil for at least uh, five years, but you started to get macular degeneration of the retina. If you switch uh, lupus medication, might that help or slow down the degeneration? Well, there's it... several kinds of, of, of toxicity of the eye, of the macula of the eye. And uh, if it's due to Plaquenil, you got to get off the medicine because it can. Uh, it's a very long-acting medicine and could get worse before it stabilizes. But it should generally stabilize when you get off the drug, but it may take a while. So if you have macular, especially a big dark spot in the macula, and they think it might be related to Plaquenil, you never can go on it again, and you get off as soon as you can. Okay, there are other kinds you. of macular degeneration that are not due to Plaquenil, but you know, if you have macular degeneration, I wouldn't take Plaquenil, because that's where the side effects occur in the eye. Okay, thank you. Great. All right. Um, I think that does it. Nobody else has any questions right now. You can go ahead and email me um, any questions that you might have or you might think of later, and we'll work with Dr. Katz to make sure that those get answered. Um, I want to thank Dr. Katz. Honestly, your presentations are always so good, and you are like you're fine with answering questions from every direction, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, I want to thank just everyone. Summarize. Let me Pardon? just summarize, too, by thanking the Lupus Society. Of course. Oh, thanks. I mean, where do you get education about lupus and find out what to do about it and where to go and more? The Lupus Society. And, you know, where, if you're not sure, um, you need, uh, you know, you need help, you call the Lupus Society. And they've been around for a long time now. There are different lupus groups, but they've been around for a long time now offering help and support. And we have to thank them because this can be a vicious disease in young people. It can be mild, too. And they're there for you, and I appreciate their help. Thank Thanks you so much, Dr. Katz. Yeah, that's very mm -hmm. kind. Um, well, thank you. And uh, thank you all for calling in. Again, I just want to remind everyone that um, this is not to provide, this presentation was not to provide medical advice or recommendations. It's not supposed to substitute or replace expert medical care. Before making changes to your medical care, consult your qualified healthcare professionals familiar with your medical condition and health status. Um, we, are, we did record this event, and we will be posting it to the website within the next few days. Um, and thank you again, everybody, for, for calling in and, for, and Dr. Katz for presenting. And please thank Alice because um, she's wonderful. And uh, we will talk with everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.
Thank you.